welcome to our online service. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. It's quite a nice day when I'm recording this. It's been lovely over the Easter weekend and a bit rainy in between. Um, trust that uh, the, the Easter period has been a blessing for you. Uh, and please let me pray for us now uh, as we start this online service. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you. Uh, believe that you can be present uh, even as we are watching this. And we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are ready to receive what you have for us just now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Alan Fraser. I used to attend Lincoln Road Chapel a number of years ago now and recently Pastor Paul Fellows has asked me to give a, a short testimony really of something that has inspired me recently in the Bible. Um, very recently the church I now attend has a Lent group which has recently finished and one of the readings that we actually looked at and discussed was uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 9 to 13, which I'm going to read to you now. It says, But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. What, but whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. 
and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. It sounds very, very depressing, really. And to say I found it encouraging and inspiring might seem a bit strange. But what concerns me is in my faith, I've always had a doubt that I could stand up and profess my Christianity and my faith in the Lord Jesus when things get bad. And in this instance, really, really bad. And some nations, this is the case. People are giving up their relatives, their families to the authorities because they are Christians and they are tortured and killed. They are true martyrs, really, in some respect. And this is not something we experience in the United Kingdom. And for that, I am eternally grateful. But we do have parts of our faith where we feel we're failing. Do we always witness when we feel we could have done? Do we always stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ? Sometimes I feel I don't. I come away from situations thinking I could have said that in this situation, or I could have done that and I didn't. And it is one of my worries. Am I strong enough in the face of adversity to stand up for the Lord? I hope I will. I hope I can. But we do all fail sometimes in this aspect. But the Lord is all forgiving. He will, if when asked, please forgive me for my error. It is put behind him, forgotten. It's quite a wonderful thing that this happens. And praise the Lord that this happens. And the final verse, the verse that really inspired me, encouraged me in this reading, in this little group of people who got together to discuss the Bible was in verse 13. And it says, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. And I guess in many respects, some people do hate us as Christians. Some people ridicule us as Christians. Some people laugh at us and some people just endure us. But we are kept by the Lord in his name's sake. And it says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And if we do endure, and we are enduring, we will be saved. And that is so encouraging and is inspiration for me. I hope, even though it seems a very downhearted passage of the Bible, and the Lord is speaking this to us himself, I hope we can all find it encouraging. Many thanks for listening to me and uh, have a blessed week. God bless. Luke chapter 24, verse 36 to 43. Jesus appears to his disciples. While the two were telling them this, suddenly the Lord himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were terrified thinking that they were seeing a ghost. But he said to them, Why are you alarmed? Why are these doubts coming in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet, and see that it is I myself. Feel me and you will know, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you can see I have. He said this and showed them his hands and his feet. They still could not believe they were so full of joy and wonder. So he asked them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of cooked fish and he took and ate it in their presence.
that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit chapter 20 verse 19 to 31 Jesus appears to his disciples it was late that Sunday evening and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities then Jesus came and stood among them peace be with you he said after saying this he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus and Thomas. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars of the nails and his hands and put my finger on those scars, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were gathered again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands, then stretch out your hand and put in my sight. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy 
are those who believe without seeing me. The purpose of this book. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performs many other miracles which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. Well, hello and welcome to our 164th Sunday online meeting for the 16th of April 2023. It's the week after Easter Sunday, I'm going to deal with one of the stories of the appearances of the risen Christ, uh, particularly to the disciples, but in connection with Thomas. Thomas's faith in the resurrection of Christ. He came to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. I'm going to make the point Firstly, that he should have believed earlier. Secondly, reasons for not believing earlier. At least I'm conjecturing. And thirdly, how he came to believe. Now, he should have believed earlier. The Lord's rebuke of him when Jesus finally appeared to him and persuaded him implies that. Jesus said, be not faithless but believing. He had been faithless. It was a rebuke. Uh, there are reasons he should have believed the report, even though, as we'll see, he was not present when the Lord appeared to him. The Lord had been teaching that he would die for about six months, the last six months of his roughly three and a half years ministry. I'm going to read you uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show to his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again. The third day, that was after Peter had recognised that he was the Messiah, the son of the living God. Um, and the Lord had been... For, on other occasions, teaching that this would happen, that he would die and that he would rise again. Also, um, Thomas had the testimony of his fellow apostles who had themselves been sceptical about the Lord's return when the women came from the tomb and told them that he'd risen. They just did not believe them. They were idle tales. They weren't going to be, as it were, taken in. But they were now taken in, at least it was true. They became convinced that it was true. Um, I'm going to read you John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. This is the first day. This is the Sunday, the day Jesus rose from the dead. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the, dis where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the middle of them and said to them, Peace be unto you. And when he'd so said, he showed them his hands and his side where he'd been nailed to the cross, the scars, and where the, 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 the guard had pierced his side to check that he was dead, and he was at that time. Uh, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They were persuaded. There, there was questionings, there was doubts at, at certain times, even when they later met him in Galilee. Some doubted it was really hard for them, but basically they'd been persuaded. Uh, this probably is exactly, certainly the same day, but probably the very same occasion. I'm going to read you some verses from Luke chapter 24 from verse 36. Um, as I say, the very same, I think, probably the very same occasion that, uh, that John re records here in the Gospel of John. Luke 24 from verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be to you. But they, and now this is, includes the, the disciples, the 10 apostles, but Thomas is not here, as we learn from John. They were terrified, frightened, and supposed that they'd seen a ghost. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it's I myself. Handle me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he'd thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. They were, that the nail was pushed through his feet as well as he was fixed 
to the cross. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said, have you any food? He didn't need food, but he was able to eat. He had a piece. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. He took it and he ate it before them. I mean, <laughs> this obviously in order to persuade them, not because he needed to eat. Um, also, had they had these disciples, who the, 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 the apostles who were attempting to persuade Thomas, because Thomas wasn't there uh, on the occasion, on this occasion, um, had they had an experience of God that changed them, not just seeing the risen Christ, but this is, let me read to you one of the things that Jesus said. This is John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. Then Jesus said to them, again, peace be to you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if this was, this was about seven weeks before when the Holy Spirit was sent by the Lord Jesus from heaven and, and they were filled with the Spirit, spoke with tongues and so on. And the church was born. A, a powerful witness was made. But was there something that actually happened? Did they have an experience of the Holy Spirit here? Or was it just like a symbol? Jesus breathing out the breath of God, the Spirit of God. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you remit, they're remitted to them. Whoever sins you retain, they're retained. If you forgive them as you preach the gospel, you tell them they're forgiven, they are forgiven. It's not your prerogative to forgive. It's God, but it's in the gospel. And if they won't receive it, their sins are retained. And you can tell them that. But receive ye the Holy Spirit. If they had this Holy, the Holy Spirit in them in a way that they didn't have before, this was a further evidence that, that uh, it was true. But in any case, they unitedly pointed to this happening. It, it should have persuaded Thomas. I won't read you the verses, but if you read the verses that follow on in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 48, it says that the Lord opened the Old Testament, as we would call them scriptures, that spoke of him as the Messiah and that the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, had to die and rise from the dead. Um, I'm not sure if that portion I just said to you was actually at this time, or it might have been later, but certainly the Lord said something similar to two people who on the first day of his resurrection were walking away from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. He joined them. And part of what he did was this. Let me read you the verses. Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. And he said to them, uh, you, you must look at the story. It's a wonderful story. But, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken in the Old Testament, Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things, to die on the cross? They, they didn't realise this. And to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he expounded to them, explained to them, in all the scripture, the Old Testament Bible, we might say, the things concerning himself. The, the apostles would have picked this up from the, the two, if, if, if from no other way, and, and they would have over a, the, the eight day in total period before Thomas actually uh, saw the risen Christ and was persuaded, they would have been explaining that this is what the Old Testament means. Here's another reason why he must have risen from the dead. Thomas should have believed earlier. A couple of reasons for him not. Uh, or suggestions as to why he didn't believe. And it's not said here. I can only guess, knowing uh, human nature being what it is, there's no good reasons, in any case, for him not believing. Was he simply sore that he'd missed out? You know, a bit cross, well, I wasn't there. Actually, a little bit later, he's one of seven uh, apostles who are present when the Lord appeared to them and there was the miraculous catch of fish. Well, he was there for that. Well, there were some that weren't. <laughs> I mean, it may just seem by chance, but the Lord is over this thing. But maybe at this time he was just rather cross that he had not seen this. 
was that part of it? Well, I think it was a rather more than that. Was it just simply stubbornness? The Lord had shown, or they said, that the apostles said, the Lord had shown, as he appeared to them, his hands and his feet, the wounds he'd received on the cross. And he said, well, unless I put my finger into those, the, the print, the, the, the marks, the wounds of his hands, and put my hand into his side where the spear wound is, I'm not going to believe. You just saw it. I, I'm going to make sure. Maybe there was an implied suggestion that they didn't really get it right. They was as daft, as it were, as the women who, who had believed it. I'm not going to until I know it's absolutely true. Yes. So, you, so what you're saying is that this united testimony of the women, your 10 comrades, uh, and, and uh, the, the two from Emmaus, and maybe more beside, are all wrong and you're right. Now this is, this is stubbornness. Looking ahead, um, uh, this is John chapter 20, verse 29, just as in this uh, idea of uh, asking why he hadn't believed, verse 29, Jesus said to them, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So in other words, the Lord felt it reasonable that he should have believed. Now, this is not saying, is it Mark Twain or one of the many things attributed to him, whether he said them all or not, I don't know. But um, faith is believing what you know ain't true or something like that. that. What kind of a God anyway would be satisfied with people who didn't really believe in him saying they did? Oh, well, that's nice. No, I, I don't think so. Um, no, no, no. You should have believed because there was evidence. That's the point. Did you know that there is overwhelming evidence to show outside of the Bible to show that it's true, as well as the internal consistency, uh, unity of the Bible? What is it? What is it? About 40 authors written over a period of 1600 years. It's just astonishing. And they all are basically saying that Christ is going to come. He's the Messiah, the promised one. He will die and he will rise from the dead. And there's plenty of evidence, not just in the Bible, but external evidence. Just look for it. I haven't got time to explain it. Now, Jesus did rise from the dead. If you don't believe that, there's something seriously wrong. may seem rude, but with you. I Maybe say a little bit more about that in a moment. I don't mean to be rude, I just want to challenge and make you think. But it's true. And finally, how he came to believe. I'm going to read you verses 26 to 29 of John chapter 20. After eight days, so the Lord appeared to the others on the, on the first day, the, the Sunday, is, is a week later. After eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Well, Thomas, stick with them. <laughs> Who knows why he wasn't present? Maybe it was a legitimate reason, maybe not. No idea. The Bible doesn't say. But he was with them this time. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. The suggestion is he appeared. He had a real body, but it could he could just appear and, and then disappear to the two on Emmaus. When they recognised him, he vanished out of their sight. The doors were shut. He stood in the middle and said, peace be unto you. It's a kind of a, maybe a typical greeting, but boy, did that mean something more to them. Uh, all your hopes are dashed, I just died. Now I'm alive, now you know peace. Peace to you. Then, he said to Thomas, directly to him, reach here your finger, behold my hands, reach in your hand, thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. In other words, the Lord knew all about what Thomas had said, and Thomas realised that. Well, there's no record that Thomas did put his finger or his hand in there. Uh, maybe he did. I, I think he didn't. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord 
And my God, that's a, I'm persuaded now. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed, happy are they that have not seen. They've had evidence and yet have believed. Um, the, the, the Lord spoke directly to Thomas. He speaks directly to us. Not, I don't mean you hear a voice. May do, but I doubt that. But the Lord deals with us directly. Deals with our genuine doubts. Well, we've already said that there was a there was a sense of these doubts not being legitimate. But still, the Lord, in grace and mercy and love, came to Thomas, and Thomas was one of the twelve disciples. I mean, it was eleven now because Judas had killed himself. Who set the 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 the, the, the doctrine of the church and, and so on? How important they were. They were human. The Lord was gracious to them and he's gracious to us. A couple of words of application. Are you honestly looking into the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If you are, and you're not yet convinced, that's fine. Because if you continue honestly looking, you will become convinced that it's true. Absolutely guaranteed. Everything hangs on this. If Jesus isn't, isn't risen from the dead, there is no faith, there's certainly no Christian faith, but there is no faith worth putting your trust in. There's no valid religion. There's no hope. That, that we're just here for a time and then it's all over. There's no forgiveness for our sins. There's no way of getting right with God. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it's verses 14 and 17, Paul the apostle says those specific things. Um, if on the other hand there is a deliberate rejection you are saying no I'm not having this no no don't give me this or you're just refusing to look you're too busy I'm sure you are busy but if you're too busy to look into something that claims to completely be able to transform your life, has transformed Western society in the past, has done amazing things for hundreds of thousands of people, and I'm not going to bother to look, and not even going to bother to, it may help my family, it may help others, I may have something useful. No, I'm just going to stay as I am in my hopeless situation and then just go into oblivion. That's not acceptable. That is not a valid, that will not wash when I stand before God uh, as a reason. But even if I've failed in this respect, I haven't properly dealt with the evidence that has come my way, as Thomas evidently didn't. The Lord in his love and mercy is gracious anyway. He came to him anyway. And he came this time while Thomas was present. So that... Well, are you persuaded now, like Thomas, with utter conviction, you know that Jesus has risen from the dead? Maybe not yet. But once you do know, God has raised Jesus from the dead. No one else. Somebody would criticise me for criticising any other religion or, or, or indeed irreligion. Jesus is the only one to have risen from the dead. There's so many other things that make him unique, his claims and so on, but they're all validated by this one thing. He rose from the dead. That means that God has singled him out and said everything he has said and done is valid. I've done this for no one else. So that his death on the cross for your sins works. They can be gone. You can be right with me. Have hope. Live forever with me. Have my life. Have something useful. Eternally useful. And satisfying to do now. And so on. This is uniquely from Christ. Well, the Lord is kind to bring that conviction to people like Thomas 
who was in a position where he wasn't really dealing with the evidence as he should have done. And the Lord is the same with us. I hope you'll be able to say it, but can you now say with utter conviction, as Thomas did, my Lord and my God. My Lord, the one who owns me, the one who I'll follow, the one who has the right to own me, has died and risen from the dead. Died for me, risen for me. My God, not mine in the sense of I own him or I've just simply selected him, but in the light of who he is, I bow to him. So he's my God. My God has died. The immortal God has died, found a way, became man to die for my sin and now has risen to save and bless and lead me. And then there's that it's my Lord. My God, not, not I own him, but I accept him personally. If you can say that, you enter into the whole of the blessing of God's life and salvation. And to miss that, the only way you can miss it is to deliberately reject truth, evidence, or deliberately put your fingers in your ears, Close your eyes, I'm not listening, I'm not looking. There's no need for that. Jesus is kind, my Lord and my God. May the Lord help you, as he's helped me and countless others. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you're so kind, so gracious, patient with us. We're, we're, we, we can't commend Thomas for not believing, but we're so glad for this example of your grace to him because you're just the same to us. Maybe we need that particular form of grace. In any case, we all need your grace. Convince us and then please give us the 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 grace, the, the common sense, the humility to follow that through and to say of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for sins, my sins and the sins of the world and who has risen from the dead, my Lord and my God. To this end we seek your help for each one of us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.